Well, it is six o'clock now. We'll go ahead and get us started here. And again, um, bear with me if I look over and need to keep ad admitting people into the, the chat. Um, we have quite a big group this evening, so we're very excited about that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Catherine Sear. I am the mu museum's exhibition coordinator, and I'm also the individual who curated the exhibit, uh, Women Behind the Lens. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight, um, taking some time to listen to this fantastic opportunity um, with Libby. Um, we're really pleased with the turnout, and I want to spend, say a special thank you to our members um, who are joining us this evening. It is your support that makes programs and exhibitions that we're going to talk about like this possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those who are not members, there's still time. There's always still time. In fact, we're running a fantastic deal right now that if you become a new member, you will get a free shipyard and lighthouse cruise. And if the weather remains anything like this throughout the spring and summer, you are certainly going to want to get out on our Merry Meeting uh, cruise boat. Um, information is available about this online. Um, that ticket, um, if you become a new member and get the cruise, um, is redeemable at any point in the season. You just have to um, reserve your spot before June 15th. So time is of the essence, but you still got some time. Um, again, just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we are very, very lucky to be joined by Libby Bischoff this evening to essentially kick off the programming surrounding the museum's exhibition, Women Behind the Lens, the photography of Emma D. Sewell, Josephine Ginn Banks, and Abby Minot. Um, just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Um, we're all familiar with Zoom programs at the moment, but it's a good reminder that we want to stay muted while Libby is talking. I will be monitoring the chat box um, throughout the evening. If you have a question, feel free to drop that in at any point. I am um, and we'll be happy to ask those questions um, after Libby um, has finished with her with her program. Um, and I'm sure you all will have lots of different um, things to ask her. Um, but I do want to introduce our great speaker. Um, again, Libby, thank you so much. Uh, Libby is the executive director at the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education, which is located on the University of Southern Maine's campus in Portland. Prior to her appointment to the Osher Map Library, Libby received her PhD in American History from Boston College and spent 11 years as a professor in USM's History Department. Her research interests include 19th and 20th century social, cultural, and visual history, with a particular focus on the history of Maine and photography. In 2015, uh, she co-authored a book with Susan Danley and uh, the amazing and wonderful Earl Shuttleworth uh, titled Maine Photography, A History 1840 to 2015. Her chapter highlighting early female, early female photographers in Maine around the turn of the 20th century is an incredible addition to the scholarship of early photography and women's history in the state. And we should all look forward to hearing more regarding this uh, research this evening. So Libby, again, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with us and the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Catherine. That was a very kind introduction. It's nice to be here with everybody. I'm live in Portland, Maine in my office where I have been on this lovely day. Um, it's nice to get a chance, you know, as a photo historian who's an administrator and professor to um, leave the world of maps, which is delightful, um, but to go back to my love of photography and particularly talking about women's photography, as, as Catherine said, this beautiful exhibit that she curated, and I'll show a few installation shots in a second when I share my screen. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the worlds of Maine women photographers and not necessarily, I'll do a deep dive into, into a few. Um, I certainly, I know Catherine's gonna be doing a talk in the not too distant future and wanted to leave plenty of room for her to talk about Abby Minot and Josephine Ginn Banks. So I won't go into like extensive detail on, on them tonight, but I wanted to talk a lot about women's photography in the 19th century, particularly in Maine 
and recovery work. And something I've been thinking a lot about really, if I'm being honest, over the past 20 years, what's so interesting to me is how much women's photographic work resides in maritime museums not just in the main maritime museum but also at the penobscot marine museum um, also at the great harbor marine museum up on mdi i just published an article in uh, the mount desert island historical society's annual journal on the glass plate negatives of lucy mcmullen dodge who was a lighthouse keeper's wife on mount desert rock um, from 1906 to 1909. I'll bring her in tonight a little bit. And that's not just unique to the United States. Um, before I took my appointment running the Osher Map Library, I was working on a big research project comparing uh, women photographers, where tonight's title comes up with, I call it Photography on the Edge. I was researching photography in Iceland, um, and particularly women photographers in Iceland. And in really interesting ways, um, Nicolene Waywat was Iceland's first female photographer, active as early as the 1860s, and a lot of her portraiture work also lives in maritime museums in Iceland. So it's not just a phenomenon unique to the United States that maritime museums hold so much of women's visual work. And I, I don't have, you know, there's no magic bullet, right, that I've found for that so far, but it's something I'm thinking a lot about and something we'll think about a little bit, um, a little bit tonight together as we really um, go on kind of a visual, a visual journey together. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and dive in. Um, so I'm looking at these worlds of Maine women photographers as an entryway into this beautiful show up at the Maritime Museum. So um, Women Behind the Lens, the photography of Emma D. Sewell, Josephine Gim Banks, and Abby F. Minot. And what's really interesting is that I'm well aware of the work of Emma Sewell. I wrote about her in Maine um, Photography, a History. I'd encountered her many times. Um, she had a reputation far beyond Maine. I knew Abby Minot's work, but Josephine Ginn Banks, you know, is really a bit of a revelation in this exhibit. And in fact, this is the first major public presentation of her work. Um, the wife of a stone cutter. Um, she became involved with photography when she got married. Um, she even you know lists that as our occupation in the in the census so what's really interesting to me is that there's so much more work to do in terms of recovery and you know what Catherine was able to do in really combing through the extensive photo collections of the museum and then you know what's going on up at the Penobscot Marine Museum who has one of the largest collections of photography in the state of Maine. Um, the Great Harbor Museum is really recovering a lot of its photography and so more and more is coming out about these 19th and early 20th century women photographers um, which I'm really delighted about. So I wanted to just start with a quote by another photographer who many people associate with the state of Maine, as this is where she lived really the second half of her life, Berenice Abbott, more of a modernist photographer. But she wrote in the introduction to Marius Pelado's um, 1970s book on Shantanetta Stanley Emmons, who I'll talk a lot about tonight. Can any medium offer us a more poignant and startling realization of the past human condition than the photographic image? This marvelous mirror of history arouses the buried mysterious past, which is ever changing, ever different, and somehow the same, to revisit us in the photograph, to place it before our eyes and stop us cold. And for such a photographic realist as Abbott, to say that about the pictorial work of Chansonetta Stanley Emmons, I think is significant in the sense that the work that these early Maine women photographers are doing 
becomes a mirror of history, right? It's, it's both an act of preservation, often mistakenly kind of pigeonholed as nostalgia. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight as well. But this past human condition, this marvelous mirror of history that allows us to really access the buried mysterious past. So as a visual historian and as someone who teaches visual history at USM, I just finished a senior seminar called Visualizing History uh, last week, um, reading finals now. But for me, photography has always been this incredible tool of the historian because it allows us to see that which can no longer be seen. I think that's really significant, particularly in photography of maritime history and maritime worlds, right? Where, you know, some of a state like Maine used to have more than 400 sardine canneries, there are zero. You can go visit historic structures, but you can't go into an active cannery anymore when there were hundreds of them along the coast. So photography becomes really important. But I will also say, and this is something I've been really thinking about and talking about a lot more later, I have a really neat fellowship this summer at the Maine Women Writers Collection at the University of New England to work on the work of a contemporary photographer, Rose Morasco, um, who, who did this incredible series um, in the 1990s and early 2000s called Domestic Objects that works to make the labor of women more visible through historic domestic objects. And for me, when I was writing Maine Photography, a history, which I'll talk more about tonight, when I was writing not the chapter on women, but the chapter on labor, it became really clear to me very quickly that the hardest thing to visualize in history is women's domestic labor. And these women photographers take us to some of that, right? There's a lot more recovery work to do. but the invisible work of women, right? And so it's really interesting to me that it's the same time we're entering into the 19th century and really seeing a growth and development of amateur photography and in the work of women in photography. We're also getting these interesting domestic scenes that are often peopled, but the women aren't always turning the camera on their own labor. And so I'll talk more about that later, but I find that to be really interesting. So these are things I'm thinking about lately between like, you know, 17th century maps and final exams and uh, spreadsheets, but it's nice to be able to think and talk about photography. So if you haven't seen the show, it's, it's gorgeous. Here's a bit of a sneak preview. Um, I'm really happy the camera is here because the work of 19th century women photographers really, <laughs> You know, this is what I most often take pictures on, right? Like my iPhone, um, I'm constantly photographing. I, you know, I take a lot of Polaroids. I do some cyanotype, but, you know, thinking about carrying this and so much of what we're looking at today are glass plate negatives. Talking about these 19th century women is really looking at the equipment that they had to carry and set up to really make this possible. And this is true of most of the women we'll be looking at um, together this evening. And so I love the way in which the gallery is set up with these big views and the camera, but then also bringing you into the intimate photographic world of the 19th century, the world of the album, the world of the stereograph, the world of the snapshot, because that's so much of this work as well, that it's deeply personal, it's familial, it is about particular people in particular places in particular times. And these albums, well-fingered, well-loved, you know, you can tell that people looked at them, that they used them. Um, and as they're using them, you know, as these women are working, I like to think a lot about what they're documenting. And so many of these main women photographers, these 19th and early 20th century photographers are documenting significant times of profound change in the world around them, in their world, right? The 19th century in Maine is very volatile. I'm a Maine historian. I teach Maine history, you know, pre and post-Civil War in Maine. 
is a really different conversation in terms of looking at labor transitions, in terms of looking at the work of the farm and the field and subsistence labor and fishing and shipbuilding, and then moving through the Civil War, shifting from the age of sail to the age of steam and how much that changes things, but also the tremendous outmigration in Maine in the 19th century after the war. Maine is one of the few states in the 19th century that loses population and not because of lower birth rates, but because of people moving west, taking advantage of the Homestead Act. So Maine in the 19th century, which is also Maine's political heyday nationally, is also a time of profound transition, profound mechanization, profound modernization, and these women really reckon with these big issues and big themes. But by the same token, and the thing I love most, I mean, if you had told me 20 years ago that I would spend the better part of my adult life studying the state of Maine, I would have thought you were crazy. But that is indeed what I have done. Um, one of the things I find really interesting, and you can see it in this photography evidenced by what these women are capturing, Modernity and tradition coexist in Maine and Northern New England in really interesting ways. You can look at a photo from Maine in the 1930s and 1940s and it's sometimes indistinguishable from 1890s Maine. And it's not because people were backwards, which is often argued. I, I don't think that's it at all. In fact, it's like, why would you replace something that's not broken? right, until you can get all the use out of it as possible. And why would you transition in an entire system if you don't know if the new one works better? But the coming of electricity, of rural free delivery, of a more national market with the railroads and shipping and what Mainers have access to changes what people want but it also changes what's possible in these small towns. As the natural resource industries decline, as steel replaces granite, you know, as Maine's canned goods aren't needed as much anymore, right? As refrigeration almost does away with the need for the ice trade, communities are really forced to reinvent themselves. And often that's what these women as members of their communities are capturing with, with, with and through their lens. And what I also find interesting about a lot of these women photographers is most of them also write. So they're not just documenting with the camera. They're also writing family history, genealogy, local history, and not just here or there. Like it's all part and parcel of the documentation, the sensitive documentation of a particular place in a particular time but also realizing the need to document this time and this place and these worlds before they disappear. And they weren't the only ones doing that, right? As Maine is shifting from natural resource industries to more of a reliance on vacation land and tourism in the 1880s and 1890s, as you see steam you know, replacing sail, that results in profound societal changes as well. There's resistance to those, there's acceptance to those, and that complex tension is often showcased in, in, a, lot of these, in a lot of these images. So I come into this a lot through this work that Susan Earle and I published in 2015, Maine Photography, A History. It came out of the main photo project, which was a statewide curatorial project that dozens of museums and historical societies and galleries participated in. Um, and this is really when I, I entered the work of Maine women photographers before this through the work of Shansonetta Stanley Emmons, but really came to it in writing the chapter about women's photography. So I give you, um, just a little, and this is the chapter in the book, chapter three, that it's about for early Maine women photographers, a paradigm. And I'll talk a little bit about these women momentarily, but I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about <laughs> this woman for a second. 
This is Frances Benjamin Johnston, not a main photographer. Uh, this is her self-portrait in 1896 from the Library of Congress where her collections live. It's a pretty fascinating and very intentional self-portrait. Um, I think it also pokes fun at a lot of portraits of the artist from you know, the 18th and 19th centuries. But I also want you to look at her mantle and I want you to continue to look at mantles throughout our time together this evening. I wrote a funny little article for Historic New England pre-pandemic at this point, maybe in 2018, um, called The Mantle of Love and Friendship, looking at the relationship between Annie Adams Fields and Sarah Orne Jewett through what was on their mantles and photography and imagery. And I just want you to look at the presence of photographs in these photographs and just really realize how visual the 19th century is, how reliant people are on photography, you know, invented as a discipline with uh, Louis-Jacques Mondet de Guerre in 1839 in France, William Henry Fox Talbot is working on the invention at the same time in England, opting with paper negatives rather than the daguerreotype process. But when it's announced in France in 1839, photography is in Maine by 1840. <laughs> It, it does not take a long time to take root here. You have Daguerrean photographers in every part of Maine, even in the rem most remote corners of Maine throughout the 1840s. And as we move through different photographic processes, ambrotypes, tin types, carte de visite, glass plate negatives, cabinet cards, film, right? 35 millimeter film. All of this is taking place in Maine. So this was not a technology that Maine resisted. Maine resists some technology, but photography was not something that Maine, that Maine is resisting. So why look at Frances Benjamin Johnston, this non-Maine woman photographer? Really, because you can't talk about Maine women photographers or any women photographers in the 19th century without thinking about an article that Frances Benjamin Johnston wrote in 1897. And she wrote an article in 1897 in the Ladies Home Journal. Catherine's shaking her head, she's read this. You can't, can't curate a show about 19th century Maine women photographers without, without reckoning with this piece. And it's easy to find online. It's called, What Can Women, What a Woman Can Do with a Camera. And so in this Ladies Home Journal article, Johnston, who was a professional photographer, she was not an amateur photographer, she made money, right? This is what was her profession. She encouraged women to take up the camera, but she also cautioned them, quote, the woman who makes photography profitable must have, as to personal qualities, good common sense, unlimited patience to carry her through endless failures, equally unlimited tact, good taste, a quick eye, a talent for detail, and a genius for hard work. In addition, she needs training, experience, some capital, and a field to exploit. And I would particularly highlight the notion some capital, and, and Catherine, I thought you did a beautiful job of really highlighting this in the show, that the women who you're looking at in this exhibit at the Maritime Museum, it's not that they were all independently wealthy, though certainly Emma Sewell was, um, but they were at least middle class, right? There was some leisure time involved, but also there was capital. You know, they had the not just the time, but the money to purchase this equipment, the camera, the tripod, the glass plate negatives, the chemicals and the paper they would need to develop, right? Um, the ability to learn, right? To read about it, to learn from other people. This is not yet Kodak, you push the button, we do the rest, though that's coming very quickly, right? So this capital is, is pretty interesting. So Johnston really just was giving a self-portrait in words because she possessed all of those qualities. And her advice was geared towards women who, like herself, right, really desired this profession that could pay them but also help lead to a life of independence. And I would argue that the lens provides a particular modicum of independence for women, particularly in a point of view. When you point the camera at whatever subject you're going to point it at, it is your point of view. 
right? It is her, these are, these are their eyes, her eyes through this lens, taking these images, right? It's, it's a freedom of expression, of personal expression and really highlighting a particular person's point of view, which could be challenging for 19th century women in domestic relationships. <laughs> it can be challenging in the 21st century, right? Figuring out how to balance all of these things. So she's looking very bohemian here. She found her freedom and independence through her camera. It was made easier by a privileged upbringing, but what's interesting about Johnston and why you must reckon with her when you're talking about other women photographers is because she is an anomaly in that she's so well known. There's many articles written about her. Her archive is huge and accessible. Um, there's a biography of her. She's the subject of dissertations, exhibitions, scholarly articles. That's not true of the great majority of these women. And I think for me, you know, I've written a lot. Main photography, I think, remains my my favorite. I don't know. All books are like kids. It's hard to pick a favorite. Um, but I really, I'm proud of that book, I guess I would say, in the sense, particularly the women's Maine women photographers chapter, not because it's the definitive work on Maine women in photography, it's not, but because it provides a published source from which other work can then be done, right? That it can help grow and develop a larger discipline and really encourage people to assist in this recovery. I mean, literally what's in the attic? That's so much of this, is saving this work from destruction I think Kevin's on tonight, as, as he knows all, all too well, right? Glass plate negatives are fragile. It's remarkable that these survive, but it's not accidental, right? This woman, this, the work of these women was important to them. It was often important to their families and it was important to their communities. So there's really a tremendous amount of recovery work to be done on women photographers working in the 19th and early 20th century. So these women are working at a time where the discipline of photography, the medium of photography, the art of photography, the business of photography, they all become more accessible to them. And a lot of that is because of new technology. Like you see on this Eastman Kodak advertisement from 1909 in front of you. Um, you had handheld cameras, dry plates, rolled film. You get more and more women, thousands of women around the United States in the early years of the 20th century, taking up practice as amateurs, as professional studio photographers, and as artists. So Eastman Kodak introduced their first roll film camera, which was the Kodak number no. one, aptly named, in 1888. And so their slogan is you press the button, we do the rest. They are, they are trying to make photography easier, less cumbersome. But what's really interesting in early Kodak advertisements, and I'm certainly not the only one to make this argument, but it's easy to see visually, they're widely marketing to women. And you can see that here to every outdoor hobby, to every delight of nature, to the very spirit of spring itself, there is an added charm for those who Kodak right? Not merely for the sake of the moment's pleasure, but even more for the pleasure in the years that follow the Kodak is worthwhile. And it's all so simple that anyone can make good, good pictures. And it's really interesting. You see this young, vibrant woman. It's a beautiful photo, you know, sitting, photographing landscapes and looking delighted in doing so, right? But it's saying, hey, friends, you know, if she can use this camera, so can you. It's a little tongue in cheek in that sense. And, you know, you see it also here in this these 1911 and 1912, they're all featuring women. All Outdoors invites your Kodak. And I think this first paragraph is really significant in this 1911 ad. Every day there are pictures right at home that are worth the taking. Pictures of the family that will always be cherished. Pictures of stock and crops and buildings that will always be of interest and value. And oh, by the way, like, if you're leaving home, you can also do this. 
This 1911 picture is remarkable. If you look at this one and you look at like 99% of the photographs I'm about to show you, they are this photograph of people hanging in a field or on the beach. <laughs> I mean, they're encouraging women to take these pictures right at home, right? And so we have these windows into these domestic and public worlds that these women are involved at. This 1912 is a little more progressive. The world is mine. I own a Kodak as her luggage is loaded onto the train car um, by Black Porter, right? And she's carrying a very slim Kodak in her hand. So not in her luggage, right? It's not packed away, it's out, it's ready to be used. Take a Kodak with you and it makes your trip more enjoyable. Anyone could take good pictures with the Kodak. Well, a lot of these women begin to capture the seasons, domestic life, agriculture, the delights of nature, the pleasure of traveling. These are things that according to Kodak in these advertisements are the purview of women. But these were things that Johnston was also talking about in her 1897 article, right? So when she's summarizing what women can do with a camera, she says, above everything else, be resourceful, doing your best with what you have until you are able to obtain what you would like. Resource, a good sense, hard work, a cultivated taste is a combination that seldom fails to success in a country like ours, where a woman needs only the courage to enter a profession suitable to her talents and within her powers of accomplishment. You know, Johnston's a bit arrogant, and I love it because she's really encouraging all of these women to do what she did. It's not accessible to all women. I think that's really important to know, but it becomes more accessible as we move further and further into the 20th century. So if we have all these advertisements from Kodak, if we have, you know, all of these calls for women to do this work, why is there so much recovery work that still needs to be done on 19th century women photographers? Um, there's a really wonderful history of women photographers by Naomi Rosenblum. And she argues there are now and were in the past many more active women photographers than show up in the compendia exhibitions and monographs. One, woman for, one reason for the scarcity of historical work by women is that it has often been difficult to find. Frequently women themselves, reflecting the attitudes of their own eras, did not regard their images as important enough to inventory and save. So unless they were kept safe by spouses or descendants, women's photographs often were discarded, tucked away in the attic or stored in a musty bin at the local historical society or museum. It's true. I mean, if you look at the maritime collections here at the Penobscot Marine Museum and elsewhere, most of the collections are, of these women photographers are donated by family members, right? Who, who had these, who preserved these for posterity. And so this is, this is the work. And in part of giving talks like this is calling people into the work, right? When you see these things, when you find them, you know, how are you going to help preserve them? How are you going to help raise this up? And for me, you know, a way of doing that work, like when the Mount Desert Island Historical Society asked me to write this piece on Lucy Dodge, for me, this is the work, right? If I write and publish a, publish a piece on another turn of the century main women photographer, then more people will know about it. And then more people will keep looking. Are there other lighthouse keepers' wives who are photographing? Yes, the answer is yes. Where are the images? We have to keep looking. Because what they really start to reveal, and I, you know, the thing I argue about Lucy Dodge, and I'll show you some of her images at the end, Mount Desert Rock is painted in text as this, and it is, I mean, it's like 20 miles off the coast. It's literally a rock that people live on with a lighthouse. Um, but it's painted as this really inhospitable barren, difficult place. And I have no doubt that it was, but her images paint a much different picture. They allow us to recover a world that text doesn't, 
And I think that's one of the reasons why these images are so important. So there's a few main women photographers on your screen in front of you. Um, we have Emma Sewell, Shantanetta Stanley, Emmons, Ruth Montgomery, Joanna Colkerd, um, Emma Lewis Coleman. These are five who I'll look a little bit at tonight. I don't have a picture of Lucy Dodge. I have a picture of her family and her husband and her nephew. That's the other hard thing. Not all of these women turned their camera on themselves. Not all of these women actively had their photographs taken. And I'll give you just a little side note about Emma Sewell since she's so important to this exhibition. When her husband ran for vice president, she made two massive scrapbooks. And I'm talking like, not just massive, like massive. They're at the main, they're in the collections of the Maine State Museum. And her, his vice presidential opponent, who I can't remember at the moment, um, his wife, the wives were featured in a lot of these articles. And the woman who was married to the vice president he was running against was a lovely young woman who photographed beautifully, right? And, and was featured in the press for her style. Emma Sewell was comfortable behind the camera, not in front of it. And what's so interesting in her scrapbooks is she covers images of herself. She, she literally pastes over herself all the time. Like she does not want to be seen. How she is seen is through her work, right? Which I find really poignant, but also it like adds to the difficult nature of this recovery and how you sometimes have to see people, particularly these women in, in other ways. So all of these women took up photography at different points in their personal and artistic lives. They shared affinity for the landscapes, the seascapes, and particularly the people of Maine, labor as well, the history of Maine. All of these women were amateurs, right? They're not really receiving payment for their images to the extent that we know. I think in some instances they are. Um, but photography was not just a way to capture some picturesque scene or some moment. It was also a way to document and preserve rural and maritime traditions that were quickly disappearing throughout much of New England, but were still alive and well in Maine. They were also amateur historians, documenting changing landscapes, changing modes of behavior. They do this with their photography. They do this with their published and unpublished written work. Um, they're fascinated by local history, by genealogy. Um, most of them are formally educated. And to give you just a sense you know, of their written work, Emma Sewell published The Rivers and Marshes of Small Point, Maine in 1909. Chantonetta Stanley Emmons wrote a book called The Old Table Chair. She also wrote The Stanley Family History. Joanna Colker had actually earned a master's in chemistry from UMaine. She is most famous for her sea shanty books, Roll and Go, Songs of American Sailormen, Sea Language Comes Ashore, right? These are what made her reputation. But what she really did, she was a super famous professional social worker for the Russell Sage Foundation. So she's writing social policy. She's not really known widely as a photographer, but this is where she begins to experiment with chemistry, which she goes on to major in. Emma Lewis Coleman published a two volume study on New England captives carried to Canada during the French and Indian Wars. She wrote a guidebook to Deerfield, Maine, and many articles on the colonial revival and how she restored houses. Um, they wrote for local audiences, they wrote for friends, but they also, some of them wrote for a national audience. So you're going to see a bit of a difference between some of the photographers who are working in rural areas and the maritime photographers. And I think it's interesting, and we'll kind of poke at that in a little bit, looking at some of these images. Sewell and Emmons belong to camera clubs. They subscribe to photographic publications. We know this. They exhibited their work locally and regionally. Colkert and Coleman more often, and Ruth Montgomery more often shared with families and friends and community members. But 
all of these women, even though they have had more play in recent years, Chancenetta Stanley Emmons is having a bit of a revival. I had a show of her of her work at UNE. They recently had a beautiful show of her work at Maine Historical. Um, more and more, and this is why, you know, Catherine, your your show is like fitting right into this. The more these women are exhibited is also equally as important to publishing about them and finding the work. It brings value to their work. It raises appreciation and attention to their work and allows people to say, oh, we have a camera like that in the attic. Graham, and, and these wooden boxes full of glass plates, right? Like it, it brings attention for what you should be looking for. But their work is underappreciated, it's underexhibited. And it's and it's not as known as it as it should be, because we can't understand the history of Maine. We can't understand the history of photography without their contributions, right? It's the same reason why my a primary collecting priority of mine at the Osher Map Library is maps made by women. I could collect maps made by women for the rest of my life. I would never achieve parity in the collection. But the history is incomplete without it, just as the history is is incomplete without the work of these women. So what's interesting to me is the way in which their work speaks to each other, even though they didn't necessarily know each other or of each other. And I'll just like run a few images of a spinning wheel <laughs> and a main attic. Um, this is Chancellor Stanley Emmons's attic in an old Maine farmhouse from 1909 in West New Portland, Maine, where she was from. And you can see the drying corn. Um, you know, is it a stage photo? Absolutely. Chancenetta is a master of natural light. This is pre-flash or pre-flash <laughs> pre that won't burn your house down as it was literally like lighting a fuse. Um, but this is an, you know, this is an attic so that you can see it this well is really testament to her skill. But the, the focus of this image is really the spinning wheel. She did a beautiful series with her daughter, Dorothy, um, who was, who became a painter. Um, this is, and they did these beautiful glass plate lantern slides and they traveled around New England giving glass plate, plate lantern shows, magic lantern shows, where they had a script that would go along with showing each individual slide on a screen. And you can see also the spinning wheels here in the attic, a much less <laughs> composed picture, maybe like a before and after. What's really interesting, and the more I look at these images, and I only notice this because I've been writing and talking a lot about grief and mourning lately, I never actually noticed that behind the spinning wheel is a Civil War era courier and Ives print of a woman in mourning, which I totally just used in a presentation a couple of weeks ago. So it's fascinating. Like this is more contemporary, you know, 1860s and all the things that you might find drawing upstairs. So you get Emma doing that, but also you get Sewell. This is Emma Sewell's The Garret, right? It's the attic again, the spinning wheel, the baskets, the drying corn the hooked rugs in the corner, the cane chairs, right? You're seeing these common themes. It's not like someone said, hey, lady photographers of Maine Unite, go take some pictures of spinning wheels. They are trying to make domestic work more visible. This is another act of preservation. Don't you wish you had, if you live in an old house, photographs of your attic at various states of disarray, you might know when things came up there a little bit better. It's also showing that no one ever threw anything away, right? It's all there to be used again. This is another Emmons image, spinning wool in West New Portland, Maine in 1910. There's a lot of back and forth about Emmons's work by scholars that I respect very much. I differ with them sometimes, but you know, is this, Lucy Butts sort of spinning because she brought it down from the attic and was doing like a yield colonial days demonstration. No, you can go, you can look at FSA photographs from the 1930s and 1940s in Maine, and you can see women spinning. This is 1942, Albert, wife of Albert Gagnon. You don't even get her name. And Catherine, two thumbs up for using the women's full names in the exhibit <laughs> and not Mrs. So-and-so as they were often known. 
But this is an Acadian FSA climb, um, client in 1942, spinning wool, right? 40 years after these are taken. Here's Shansen and Stanley Emmons. Here's Emma Sewell and Mrs. Young, right? These are domestic acts that are ongoing, that are connecting through generations. Is there an elements of nostalgia? Yeah, of course. But it's 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 natural, I think, in a, in a time of profound transition. Same thing, you look at Emma Lewis Coleman down in York Harbor, um, taking a photo of George Henry Donnell, a lobsterman with the wooden traps in the 1880s. And you look at Emma Sewell, also in the 1880s, focusing on lobstermen fulling traps in similar boats, different parts of Maine, Southern, mid coast. Not because no one's doing this anymore, but also to give the character of a place, which they're both particularly skilled at, which a lot of these women photographers are skilled at. So because Emma Sewell is such a such a significant part of this exhibit, like let's take take a little take a take a minute just to look at at her and her work and to think about how she comes into photography. So she's born in 18, in 1836. She grows up as the daughter of a prominent shipbuilding family. She comes to photography in the mid 1880s. She's nearly 50. Right. She sends her two sons off to college. She purchases a five by seven wooden field camera and, and glass plates to initially document a cross country journey via rail. Why is she documenting a cross country journey via rail? Well, because her husband also worked and invested in railroads. <laughs> and so it was, it was open to her. She was the wife of Arthur Sewell, who was a prominent shipbuilder in Bath, a banker, a civic leader, he runs with William Jennings Bryan, Democratic ticket in 1896. She is very likely to turn her lens on the landscapes and peoples of mid-coast Maine. She joins the Postal Photographic Club of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. And this is actually where amateur photographers would send their portfolios via the post back and forth and comment on each other's work. It's a really cool club idea. It's like correspondence photo club. And so she is invited on the basis of the strength of her work in 1894 to join the ranks of Boston Camera Club. She's one of the first women who is admitted to the Boston Camera Club. She's also one of the oldest members. She's 58 when she joins. She wins top honors in club exhibitions throughout the 1890s. Boston newspaper critics call her one of the foremost women amateurs in the, in the country. But what she's exhibiting are people from Mid Coast, Maine, her um, her great granddaughter Abby Sewell wrote a biography of Emma called "Message Through Time," which is a beautiful book, and writes the beauty Emma saw in her subjects came from a longing for a lifestyle she could only glimpse and never be a part of. As a woman of privileged upbringing and great wealth, Emma was set apart from her subjects. She romanticized working people like other pictorialists of her era, but for Emma, the reasons were intrinsic rather than stylistic. She admired and perhaps envied a simpler, more direct relationship with nature and the world. Her own life by contrast was overly complex, full of social and dress constraints, protocol, and demands that had little to do with what really mattered in life. The few portraits that remain of Emma, as you can see here, all show a woman who looks stiff and constrained by the formality of her attire and her environment. But if you look, at the images she took, like Fisherman's Children of 1886, it's a very it's a very sympathetic portrait of children when hers were grown and gone. You know, she takes up photography as as an empty nester, right? So you can see her turn her lens on children. Many women do, like domestic subjects are the primary focus for many women photographers at the turn of the century. They were also the subjects closest to hand, right? In the world that these women moved through. So you can see here the young boatman from 1890 getting beautiful views of the rocky coast. 
Herbert Wallace in his father's fish house in 1890. You can see um, the duck decoys down here too, really beautiful carved wood. But this to me, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely image. It's, it's a portrait of Herbert Wallace, but it's also a portrait of what a fish house looks like in Midcoast, Maine in 1890. The traps, the oars, like what were people doing? Like it gives us this window into this world. Cutting thatch in 1890. We know thatch in marshes is still cut this way well into the 1890s and early 1900s. Her work is exhibited as far away as Paris, right? It's really, I mean, she's, she's in the 1895 Paris Photo Club show. And this is what she's showcasing. Clam diggers, rural individuals, right? The people that she was surrounded with in her everyday life. She's also a writer. She publishes The Rivers and Marshes of Small Point in 1905. And I just want to read you a passage from this, just so you know what an observer she was. She was quiet. She had a rich interior life. She really was most at home at the family's summer home, the dunes on Small Point, which they built in 1899. She collected local folklore. She researched genealogy. And I think her photographs are that much richer because of her desire to know the people around her. They're not as if she's a socioeconomic outsider. She is an insider to the place, right? And it's richly important, important of her. It's a loving portrayal of a way of life that was challenged by industrialization, that was challenged by tourism, but it wasn't gone yet. It still isn't gone yet. She stopped taking pictures after her husband died in 1900. She actually gave her camera to one of her grandsons in 1901, and she lived until 1919. But she didn't stop producing visual narratives. She was an active scrapbooker. She made elaborate scrapbooks in these late years of her life. So sure, maybe she passed photography off to a younger generation but she didn't stop seeing the world in this way and trying to visually rearrange it. But just listen to how she writes. Descending a rocky hill on her left was a piece of stone wall of extreme age, weather stained, lichen covered, its lower stones deeply bedded in the soil, in some places apparently held up by the wild hawthorn and the black alder bushes, which in long years have grown up beside it, thrown out of line by the frosts of many winters. It still seems to creep slowly down the hill towards the marsh. Coming on to the opposite bank, at first we look in vain for the road obliterated by each tide, but finally in the distance, among the scattered tufts of stiff grass and the purplish clumps of marsh rosemary, we saw the marks of wheels here and there full of water. We followed them carefully, feeling like trespassers, so strange and uncanny was it all. On and on they wound, keeping the higher ground close to the dunes or to the huge logs and debris of all kinds. We seemed to be out of humanity's reach, the marsh, its brown grasses and winding saltwater river, now at low tide a mere thread, stretched far away to the north till it met the distant spruces. It's beautiful. Right, and also very in keeping with 19th century regionalist writers that were her contemporaries, like Sarah Orne Jewett, like Celia Thaxter, also women knowing places and times. And so I think you can see, you know, this come out in, in her work, as you can with Emma Lewis Coleman, who photographed, you know, who was born in 1853 and lived until 1942. Coleman was a young school teacher. Um, she met, um, she's often associated in many ways with the colonial revival movement in Deerfield and also in the Piscataqua region of Maine. She belonged to the family of a prosperous Boston merchant. And she came to photography through friendship. And I think this is really important. A lot of these women come into photography through friendships with other women not always photographers, sometimes artists, but C. Alice Baker, who was a history teacher 
and Susan Minot Lane, who was a painter and a student of William Morris's hunt, William Morris Hunt, like Coleman met these two older women and they took her into their life and they traveled throughout New England and Canada and to the Azores. And she began experimenting with photography when they were all teaching private tutoring the daughter of um, a German consul in Brookline, Massachusetts. And so it's really interesting to see the way they come to York, Maine in the 1880s and they build a house and they settle. Baker purchases a, a property on Kittery Point. Um, and so you can see the work that they're doing in staging kind of images of colonial revival. Um, here are some of Coleman's pictures, but you can see how they're also influenced by French painters like Millet. Here's the photographer Peter Henry Emerson Marshman going to cut uh, shoof stuff in 1885. But here's Coleman's beautiful documentation of the built environment of York, of gathering kelp for gardens, of sloops in the York River. They dress each other up <laughs> and they take these um, colonial revival images. Many of these are at historic New England. But one of the things I wanna show you quickly is just that one of the things that Emma Lois Coleman did is she photographically illustrated Sarah Orne Jewett's Deep Haven. And it was never published, but this is at Harvard. And you can see this is to Miss Mary Jewett, Sarah Orne Jewett's sister in South Berwick. And it says photographs to illustrate Deep Haven. So we know she did this project. There are a couple extra illustrated ones that exist. Here, were, here was her writing of what they chose from the book to go and illustrate. And then here are the photographs. And if you just look at how she's illustrating Deep Haven, here are the book's main characters. It is all about the landscape, female friendship, the maritime world, and the beautiful landscapes. This is Cialis Baker, the historian, as Mrs. Bonnie, who's a character in the book. I think this is Emma Lewis Coleman. So they're illustrating work that is resonant with their work, changing time periods, tourism coming in, the age of sail going away, profound change. They're taking the photographs to illustrate Jewett's prose. So in just looking at Chansonetta Stanley Emmons's work, she's more from rural Maine, right? She's from Kingfield. She comes from a very famous family. Um, her brothers invent the Stanley steam engine, but more notably the dry photographic plate process, which they sell to Eastman Kodak. So she comes to photography through her brothers. Here's her self-portrait in 1904. But I will also tell you she's trained as a painter, as a miniaturist. St this, this is on ivory. She painted this of she and her husband. And Chansonetta knew tragedy. Her husband died very early on in their marriage. He died in 1898, leaving her the single mother of a daughter. She and, she and her daughter were really very financially taken care of by her brothers who had made a lot of money in the automobile industry and hotel investments in selling out to Eastman Kodak. But that allowed her, as well as her artistic training, she studied with J.J. Anneking in New Hampshire and, and elsewhere. So you can look at his paintings and really see a lot of her aesthetic that she takes into her photographic work. But she focuses on home all the time, even when she lives in Dorchester, Massachusetts with her husband and her daughter. It's always about King Fields. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture of the Stanley Homestead. This is rural New England. This is the world that is her world, even though she lives in a bustling streetcar suburb of Boston, this is home. This is her family home, this is the homestead. And she wrote the Stanley family history. And you can see like the way in which her writing is also her imagery. The stones were gathered up, the roots and stumps removed, leaving a clear field of rich soil, the old stone walls, which stand as the most forcible records of our early farmers and their laborious tasks in converting the land into a state of cultivation, have nearly all passed from sight. And except to such of us can hold them in appreciative memory, there is little left to bring to the minds of the present generation the strenuous work of our ancestors in early times, until she also then picked up a photograph 
right, picked up the camera and made the photographs that would bring these things to mind and continue to do so. There she is carting that tripod that you have in the show, right? Like same camera um, to take these pictures. And she documents her daughter all through her youth, which is so beautiful. They have a really amazing artistic relationship. This is my favorite Emmons picture. It's called The Coming of Mechanization. And this is her daughter, Dorothy, and her dog watching like haying be mechanized, sort of, <laughs> as we go through. Um, but really, there's a graveyard over here on the left. You can see behind the fence. Really, this merger of past and present of older and younger generations, of the way we did do it, of the way we are doing it, of the way we might do it, that really comes out in a lot of this work. She doesn't always leave out power lines and telegraph lines. People argue that she does, but you know, here's the machinery. She takes it to traditional practices. Here's her uncle and her daughter. But here's the same thing going on in the Dingley Corn Shop in Farmington Falls in Western Maine around the same time period. Just beautiful images and glass plate slides, but also modern. I know this is very non-chanton as Stanley Emmons as you might know it, but this is what she's doing in the 1910s. Beautiful portraits of mothers and children on Sebago Lake and at camp and gorgeous portraits of her daughter as a young woman becoming an artist. So in kind of thinking these through and, and wrapping things up, and this is what her daughter goes on to do, right? Like, this is what her mother is doing. This is what her daughter is painting. Chansonetta continues to take photographs, unlike some of the other women, and this is her self-portrait in 1937 as a much older woman, which I, which I love. So in thinking about these worlds, right, like looking at Joanna Colcord, um, who's a sea captain's daughter. I love this photo of her dad that she's taking off the Cape of Good Hope. As these main women have access to wider worlds through their maritime families, their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, this time on ships, this time in the world, their lens expands, their worlds expand, and they bring us deeply into this world as they saw it and they knew it. Both the big view of ships that they're passing and intimate deck views of their family. And then also took that work, Colcott's work is remarkable. This is some of her later work when she's working for the Red Cross. But also like Ruth Montgomery, who's also a sea captain's daughter. This is her father, Edelbert Montgomery, aboard the Carrie Winslow in 1901. You get this far away world, but also the intimate world of friendships and relationships and parlors and stepmothers and friends and women and children, these intimate domestic worlds. This is a gorgeous photograph of Ruth herself in 1905 at the shore. And so through the work of these women, we really gain access, not to things that can no longer be seen. Go to any beach this summer, you'll see the same thing. It will probably be me with my children in the water. Um, but into these worlds of possibility, to see these women up close through the lens of other women when they let their guard down, where they're more comfortable and getting these intimate glimpses into domestic life and a changing Maine and the intimate inner workings of a lighthouse 20 miles out to sea where they have to bring bags of soil out to grow flowers and plants. As you can see the kids here in the garden looking at the nasturtium right? It's, it's no longer just an isolated world. It's family. It's friendship. And it's something we can't get anywhere else. And so I think the more we look at these images, the more we do this work together, the more recovery we take part in, the more we will understand and know not just about the lives of these women, but the communities and the places where they lived. So I'm going to stop there.
Libby, thank you. This is just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, takes me back to the research I was doing for this exhibition and thinking about these women, you know, not only as photographers, but humans, as mothers, as wives, as people that are a part of a society that they are actively participating in, and then actively having a role in the documentation of that. And this is something that I think, you know, has been really fascinating to dig into and whatnot. And I, I love your discussion about the domestic scenes. And that was one of the things that with Josephine, um, again, Banks's work, and if you haven't been to the exhibit, um, please come and see it. Uh, but her section of, of, of the exhibit, I really focused on the scenes that she did with particularly babies and children, mm -hmm. because I felt like, you know, again, Emma's work and Abby's work was known. And in the case of Emma's, there are these kind of romanticized scenes of Maine, of Bath, of the local area. And then with Abby, you know, we have the, the boat building scenes, like literal ship building happening in her backyard. But what we don't often see again are those, those images of, of children and babies. And especially with Josephine who worked for, who, or, or took photos in the, the prospect uh, area for, for, for many, many years, could actually see individuals grow up over time. And so making sure that we noted that that was a part of these women's lives and the work that they did was, was super important. And I wonder if you could maybe speak to the fact that maybe it is this subject matter, this, these domestic scenes that are you know, potentially the, the reason why they've gone missing or weren't saved or you have thoughts about that? Yeah, or were saved, but dispersed. Or dispersed, right? Yeah, exactly. So like if I'm, you know, Ruth Montgomery or, you know, Josephine Banks or Abby Mine, you know, if I'm taking some of these images and I'm taking them of my friends and their families and community members, then I'm likely going to give them the prints, right? And so they may very well still exist, but in other people's family albums. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's so much the case. And I also think... It it is also about amateur photography. I mean, Emma Sewell, I think she understood she was good. Yeah. Even though she was shy, she wouldn't have been in that camera club. She would certainly have not paid admission to the Boston Photo Club. Like she had a she was more aspirational mm -hmm. in her work. I mean, she won medals at the Paris photo exhibition. But I think then she steps back into grief, right? Into loss, into a more Victorian kind of 19th century mentality. So I think to me, one of the things where I, I think so much is, is missing is because if we don't understand the larger worlds of societal expectations for these women, um, she wasn't necessarily gonna be a Frances Benjamin Johnston, like a single woman roaming the town. Like her husband died and it gutted her and she stopped a thing that she loved, right? And so I think, I also think a lot about why these women stop, mm -hmm. right? Is it because they no longer have time? Is it because their domestic responsibilities take over? Is it because it was a fun habit for a while, but now they do something else? I mean, I, I think there isn't a tremendous amount of consistency in the length of time of, of the work um, for many of them. Um, and so, and sometimes they're also just doing it for themselves mm -hmm. and they may save it or they may order it. I mean, it is an accident that we have so much of Shanson and Stanley Emmons's work because m much of it was, was attempted to be thrown away like with the second husband of her daughter who was like essentially getting rid of it. So the women don't have a very significant control over their archive. And I think that's part of it too. So a lot of it gets dispersed mm -hmm. to the people who the images are from. A lot of it is not saved by future generations for one reason or another through accident or on purpose in some cases. Um, and in some cases, the women themselves didn't necessarily want it to be saved as kind of part of their life. So I think there's so much more to see, but because 
their domestic objects and domestic scenes they're sometimes overlooked very much absolutely i think a good testament to go checking the attics as always to see what one has and when in doubt bring them to catherine the museums yeah, that's <laughs> but if you find any maps bring them to me <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, we did have one question from the crowd um, uh, regarding Chancenetta. Um, Matt asked, was or are there scripts still available or do they still exist for the Lantern shows that she did with her daughter? Oh, if only. So if you find them for me, let me know. Um, <laughs> we know, so you can kind of piece it together because they're still in the wooden boxes, right? Like they're hmm. still in the sets. So. The Stanley Museum owns the Sanchonetta slides, but the Sanchonetta work is on deposit at Maine Historical right now for like safekeeping and preservation. So you can see them. We can reconstruct the shows a bit through newspaper articles, like where they were presenting to women's clubs and things like that, but not the script itself. But I wouldn't be surprised if it at some point turns up um, in the archives. So. I think um, it's significant in, I think, I think it's possible that we'll find some more of it. And, you know, with, with lantern slides that were published by companies like the Keystone Company, they often came, like teachers would use them in classes at the same time period, they often came with little typescripts to read aloud to the kids about what they were looking at. So the, this type of show was extremely popular, but we don't, to my knowledge, trust me, I, I want that script as much as you do. Um, know exactly where where those are, but with further newspaper work, I think we'll be able to reconstruct even more of them. I only focused on Chansonetta's main work, by the way. She has remarkable work of the South, mm -hmm. particularly North and South in South Carolina, and particularly looking um, at race and post reconstruction mm -hmm. in a really interesting and sensitive way. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, there's way more written work on Chancenetta than there was 20 years ago when I started, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. So there's plenty to read about her. Um, Laura is asking about, um, can we expect a book about some of these remarkable women? Yeah, I hope so. Um, in, in seeing more of them. Right now it's articles and chapters for me as, a, as an executive director of a busy place. Um, but there's a lot more dissertations being written on women photographers. There's a lot more exhibitions. And I think the continual documenting of, of that work is going to be a big part of that too. Nancy, to answer your question, the photographer associated with the Red Cross um, was Joanna Colkard. And only for a minute as part of her work in the late 19 teens, early 1920s. And she really, she had done most of her camera work sailing with her father to the Far East and elsewhere. And then she picked up the camera again for a moment when she was doing some of this Red Cross work in the US Virgin Islands and, and elsewhere. Um, that's all at the Penobscot Marine Museum. Um, and it's really, it's stunning, her, her social work with the camera. Colcourt is fascinating. There should be an entire book about her. Well, and I think, you know, to, to echo your point, research doesn't stop with, with this exhibit. It is continuing, I know from the museum standpoint, we are hoping to get um, uh, and, and digitalize all of the photos, not only that you see in the exhibition, which is a very, very small, you know, fraction of the more than 2000 images, just of these three women within the collection. We're hoping to get those digitalized, you know, out on our website, accessible for folks to see. And yeah, opportunities for maybe people to be like, oh, I know who that is. That was my family member. So that Absolutely. we can start to identify these folks and continue just to add to the record. So yeah, research is still happening. Maybe writing will happen at one day uh, as well for, for me and myself, but um, we will continue to do the good work going forward. And this is just Maine. Exactly. You know, like there's so much more of this recovery work. And um, there was a historian, Peter Palmquist, who did a lot of work on, on the recovery of women photographers, particularly in the West. And he, and you should know about this, Catherine, too. He, uh, his family sponsors a fellowship in his honor, the Peter Palmquist Fellowship, which is only for work on um, women in photography mm. and history to do and to fund some of this recovery. So I think 
you know, with that sponsorship, with more and more people looking for this work and with more and more people trying to resurrect the daily life and the voices of women in the past and not just a token way, like in a way to really understand um, their lives and their worlds. These images are so important to, mm -hmm. to doing that. So more to come for sure. Um, but I'm excited uh, for your talk too, Catherine, and to hear yes. more about the women in the show. Yes, we don't have a date uh, yet, but aiming for September at some point, again, when we have that information, it'll be readily available on the website, but I'm certainly looking forward to it as well. So I want to again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Libby, for this amazing talk. Um, we look forward to doing more with the exhibit in the future, uh, in the coming months. Um, but again, if you haven't come and seen it, please stop in. Um, Community Day, May 20th, just around the corner, free admission for everybody. Good time to come on by. Um, the show will be up for the, the rest of the year, so you do have plenty of time if you can't make it uh, before then, um, but we look forward to seeing you soon at the museum. Thank you, thanks everybody. everybody who came. So nice to have you here, and thanks for your, for your interest and your time tonight. Perfect. Really appreciate it. Um, hi, Miriam former student <laughs> <laughs> love it <laughs> um, it's great what a nice night Catherine thanks so much yeah, and no uh, when does the show close um it will close January ish oh there's plenty of time so there's plenty, plenty of time, of time yes. to go and see it there's a little bit of uh flexibility um at least through the end of the year but likely into a little bit of January so okay fantastic yeah. well I can't wait to come see it again <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right good night everybody good night